go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father, we're grateful to be here. We're grateful that you're the great I am. We're grateful, Father, that you sent your Son uh, to dwell amongst us, to walk a perfect, sinless life, to be the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice that you rose from the dead, you defeated death, you defeated sin, Lord. You are so good. You are the great God of the universe, and you call us your children. We're so humble. We are so humbled and grateful to simply be in your presence, not only here, but every second of our lives. Thank you for being the transcendent God that saves. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kiddos, you can be dismissed and head out with Miss Susan. Well, friends, good morning. Uh, welcome to Christ Church. Uh, my name is Blade. If you're watching online, I uh, want to welcome you as well. Um, we've, uh, we've got a lot of sick, sick people. I, was, uh, I don't know if you guys saw, but Jessica put on the uh, prayer page last night. Uh, that Wyatt has a 104 temperature, and, and he is not the only one, man. We've got a bunch of people that have been battling some sickness. In fact, uh, my family and I kind of had a rough week as well. We were on the road a lot, but we were also kind of snotty-nosed and all that kind of good stuff too. So stay healthy, go into one of the bathrooms, get you some hand sanitizer, do one of these things, you know, just wipe it off. Okay. Well, good morning. We're starting a new series today uh, called I Am, Jesus in His Own Words. I Am, Jesus in His Own Words. Um, in the book of Exodus, uh, this is a very iconic story um, uh, where the Lord comes to Moses in a burning bush, right? His, uh, the Lord's people, Israel, are held captive in Egypt, and, and the Lord is wanting to, to bring his people out of the land of slavery and into freedom, into the promised land, right? And the Lord comes to Moses in a burning bush. Let me read to you just real quick, and if you're looking at the screens today, I didn't spoil you. So get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. This is going to be the only picture on the screens today. The only, everybody's reaching for their Bible. I do spoil you. Wow, I spoil you. You're welcome. Okay, get your Bibles out. You need to open them. Um, so in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, um, the Lord comes to Moses in a burning bush. And if you take a look at verse 14, um, well, in verse 13, Moses protested, right? The Lord's calling Moses. Moses like, but I, I'm not good enough, right? God, I'm not good enough. Moses said, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me, well, what is his name? And Moses is talking to this burning bush, and he says, what should I tell them? And this is how God responds to Moses. Take a look at verse 14, Exodus chapter 3. I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, right? Y-H-W-H. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. And what is it? I am, right? So the Lord comes to Moses, really kind of a freaky deal. I, I would be scared, right? If I see a burning bush, like I'm going to get a water hose or something, right? Well, they didn't have water hoses back. Okay. Anyway, the God says to Moses as he's calling like, who should I tell the people you are? And he says, my name is I am. Not I was or I will be, I am. So over the course of this series that we're starting today, we're going to look at how Jesus 
completes the sentence, right? The Lord says, my name is I am, and seven times, seven times, I don't know if you know anything about numbers, but seven is the number of completion, right? Completion. So seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this phrase, I am. So people ask me all the time, well, why was Jesus really crucified? This is why. He claimed to be God. He didn't get crucified for doing miracles. He didn't get crucified for just being a good dude, being awesome, walking on water. That's not why they crucified him. They crucified him because he claimed to be God. So if you have your Bibles, which you should, open them up to John chapter 6. John is in the New Testament. Uh, John is one of uh, the Lord's disciples and apostles, the one whom he loved the most, right? John's a very poetic uh, book. It's kind of a difficult one to read if you're brand new to faith, if you're brand new to reading the Bible. John's kind of a challenging one. But today we're going to be in John chapter 6. So if you find Matthew, Mark, and Luke, just go one more to the right and you're going to be there. John chapter 6. If you're still struggling, go to the very end of your Bible. There's a, there's a list on what pages everything is on. John chapter 6. So as this chapter opens up, we find Jesus preaching to a multitude of hungry people. Right? You guys might remember this story. But as he finishes his message, he's aware that they are in need of not just spiritual food, but food for their bodies, right? So he's preaching to multitudes of people at the beginning of this chapter, and he preaches this amazing message, and then everybody's like, but I'm hungry, right? So he does what only God himself could do. He takes five small loaves of bread and two small fishies, and feeds a multitude that may be equal to 15,000 people or so. The Bible says 5,000 men, and if they had their women and children with them, it could be upwards of 15,000 people. Like we're talking about Labette County all in one spot. Every city, every town in our county all in one spot. Jesus is preaching. People are relaying the message, and then everybody's like, I'm hungry. You ever get hangry? You guys know what hangry is? Hangry is when you're hungry and angry at the same time. It's the way my children wake up every day. <laughs> Literally, you could say, hey, Afton, it's time to, it's time to wake up. We've got to go to church. I'm hungry! And it's like, okay, well, get dressed, go to the bathroom, brush your teeth like we're going to go as fast as we can. We'll get you some food, right? So Jesus takes five small loaves of bread, two small fish, and feeds maybe 15,000 people. And after all the people were satisfied, after all the people that had been sitting on this hillside listening to Jesus' message, he, he feeds the multitudes. After they're all satisfied, there's 12 baskets of food left over. One basket for every doubting disciple. And this remarkable miracle is a life-sized illustration for a sermon that Jesus was about to preach. In this passage, we're presented with a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this passage, Jesus is fixing to present that he is the bread of life. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't care about the Super Bowl today. I do, okay. Okay. I do a little bit because some of my best friends are Chiefs fans, and, and uh, it, goes every, it goes against every single thing in my spirit to root for the Chiefs because I'm a Raiders fan, and we're in the same division, and it just, it's like a, ah, it's like, it's like a Rangers fan rooting for the Astros. Like, it just doesn't happen, right? We're an Astros fan rooting for the Rangers. I ain't never going to do that. But I don't care as much about football uh, as I do baseball, which starts in two weeks, so get ready for that. Um, but since my team is never in the Super Bowl, um, 
the only thing I get to look forward to is commercials and food. Now, what is your favorite Super Bowl food? Do you have it? I have mine. I doubt my wife's going to make it today, but I have my favorite. She makes an incredible seven-layer dip. I don't know what the seven layers are. I think it's like beans and like something else. There's like six, <laughs> there's like six other things that go in there. I don't know, guacamole maybe. I don't know, it goes cheese. I don't know. Uh, but I love Super Bowl food. I, I have a quick question for you. Just, just by a show of hands, how many of us have eaten bread in the last 24 hours? Any sort of bread. I'm talking gluten-free bread, muffin, cereal, whatever. So is that everybody? <coughs> Unless you're like fasting, right? Which, praise the Lord for that. You know, bread is an interesting portrait of Jesus. Because bread is a substance known and used by every society on the face of the planet. For Americans, we go to the store We buy our bread. For the savage, living out in the jungle of nowhere, they cook their daily ration of bread on a stone over the fire. Bread is consumed by people everywhere. But by the same token, most people enjoy bread. I love bread. I I don't know why, but just... I love gluten, man. I just give it all to me. I want all of it. You're going gluten-free? Give me your stuff, right? You know, some people like meat and others don't. We call those, okay, I'm not going to go there. Some people like meat, other people don't. They want to be vegan or vegetarian. That's fine. Some people like greens and you know, broccoli and spinach and cauliflower. I do. I love greens. I I love my vegetables raw. You cook them, I ain't eating them, right? I love them raw. But some people don't like vegetables. But bread is one of the few foods that can be tolerated by almost every digestive system by people all over the world. You know, bread has a satisfying quality that few other food products have. Any way you slice it, no pun intended, bread is a good food. And bread is one of those things that most people need. They need it, they use it, they enjoy it. And when all of this is taken together, it kind of makes sense why Jesus says that he is the bread of life. This morning, we're going to take a look at some of the words of the Lord, and I want you to see that Jesus, not only was he the bread of life then, but he's the bread of life now. He's the one that satisfies. He's the one that that the whole world needs. He's the one that we can partake in. There isn't a person in the world who can't tolerate him. There isn't a person in the world that can't digest Jesus. And there isn't a person who won't enjoy him when they meet him. So we're going to spend just a few minutes in John chapter 6 today. So let me set the groundwork before we read some verses here, okay? Jesus had just fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. Now I say that because my wife always gives me a hard time Because to me, a couple could be three or four, but apparently a couple means two. Are you guys agree with that? Wow. Okay, so there's a few loaves of bread and a couple, several loaves. What is it? Is a few three? Okay, whatever. There's five loaves of bread and there are two little fishies. And he feeds thousands of people. Right? And then night comes. His disciples can't find him. So what do they do? They get in their boat and they cross the big lake or sea, wherever you want to read it, depending on which gospel you're reading. 
They cross the sea, and as they're getting across the sea, a couple miles, I think the Bible says something like four miles into it, they look out, and there's a storm, but Jesus is walking on water, right? So he shows another miraculous sign to his disciples about walking on water. They cross to the other side, but the people on the other side of the lake that he had just fed realized that Jesus is no longer with them, but they also know that he didn't go with his disciples. So they're like, where is Jesus? Let's cross the sea. Let's see if he's over there. So all of these people, they cross the sea to go see if Jesus is over there, and that's when Jesus is fixing to preach another message. And, and basically what happens is, is they say, show us another sign, right? Show us another sign. They say, Moses led the people into the desert, and Moses gave manna from heaven to feed the Israelites, Show us another sign. And Jesus says in verse 32, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And he offers you the true bread from heaven. Read with me. The true bread, verse 33, of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, sir, they said, give us that bread every day, right? They're like, we want that kind of bread. We want life. Give us that bread. And this is how Jesus responds. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you've seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Now, Jesus just says, I'm the bread of life. This is how the people respond. The, verse 41, the people began to murmur in disagreement because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. In their mind, all they can think about is the manna that the Lord gave to the Israelites in the desert. So they're starting to complain because he said, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Je Wait. Time out, guys. Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father. We know his mama. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, and this is what he said. He said, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. That's like the fourth time he said that now. As it is written in the scriptures, that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, whom was sent from God, have seen him. He continues, verse 47. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes, say it with me, anyone who what? believes has eternal life. Jesus is going to make this statement again. He says, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I, offer you, offer, which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. Then the people, you thought they were arguing about him coming down from heaven. Now, he says, this bread I'm going to give you is my flesh. The people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man... Give us his flesh to eat. So Jesus again said, verse 33, I tell you the truth. 
I tell you the truth. Take this seriously. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you cannot, I'm going to say it again, you cannot have eternal life within you. Jesus preaches this message. I'm the bread of life. And they say, whoa, you didn't, you didn't come down from heaven. Like, we know your mama. We know your daddy. We just had supper with your papa. Okay, whatever. And then he says, not only did I come down from heaven, not only am I the bread of life, this bread is my flesh. And then they're like, what? whoa, what? We got to, like, eat you? What are you saying here? And they start complaining in arguing. Let's take a look at some of the things that stand out in this passage. First off, the first thing that stands out to me is that the bread of life, heaven's bread, is a person. Right? That sounds simple, right? Heaven's bread is not just bread. Heaven's bread is a person. Look at verse 34 and 35. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, how? I am the bread of life. So the heaven's bread is a person. And according to these verses, the bread of heaven is not a system. The bread of heaven is not a denomination. Heaven is not a religion. The bread of heaven is a person. And his name is Jesus. This simple truth serves to remind us that we can never, never be saved by just some religious system or method. Salvation, hear me, salvation comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm going to read to you a short verse out of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we might be saved. The name underneath heaven, the only name that gives salvation is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Heaven's bread is a person. I think the second one that stands out to me is that heaven's bread, Jesus, has power. He has power. Take a look with me again at verse 35. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Heaven's bread has power. This bread has the power to save. This bread has the power to secure us. This bread has the power to satisfy every sinner who comes to him by faith. This bread has power. Power. This is what separates Jesus from all the religions and self proclaimed messiahs of the world. They will promise great things, but they can only deliver death. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 16 says. Maybe. Let's see, is Proverbs, is that in the Old Testament? Okay. Proverbs chapter 16. Bad joke, I'm sorry. Verse 25. There is a path, Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a path before each person that seems right. But it ends in death.
the self-proclaimed messiahs and true religions of the world will promise great things, and they can make it seem right, but they deliver death. Jesus, though, Jesus promises life, salvation. Jesus promises security, sanctification, satisfaction, and absolute safety for every soul of mankind. Not only that, he delivers every time. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Savior that I want to serve. Jesus not only promises it, but he lives it out. The bread of life rose from the grave. He defeated death. He is God. So heaven's bread, number one, he's a person. Heaven's bread has power. And heaven's bread has promise. Take a look with me again at John 6, verse 47. Jesus says this. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who what? Believes has eternal life. He says, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. He continues, verse 50. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever in this bread which I will offer to the world to live is my flesh. So heaven's bread has promise. These verses tell us that that the bread of heaven, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will give men and women life. He'll give us life. And here's the thing. This is why this illustration, I think, hits home for so many people is that Physical bread, right, the bread that you eat, can sustain you for a long time. But after a time, it will wear off. The bread doesn't do any good for you anymore. The body body will still die, even though it was well fed. Jesus, on the other hand, is the bread that gives everlasting, eternal life. When Jesus is received, he gives a salvation that lasts for all eternity. Heaven's bread has promise. Nothing can ever take that away from the person, from the person of God. Not hell, not the powers or principalities of the world, neither death nor life nor anything in all creation can take away what Jesus has promised his children. The simple fact is this. Every person who places their faith in Jesus for salvation is going to live forever. Heaven's bread has promise. Last one here. Heaven's bread has a price. So heaven's bread is a person, heaven's bread has power, heaven's bread has promise, but heaven's bread has a price. Take a look at verse 53 with me. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Heaven's bread, Jesus Christ, has a price. You see, before heaven's bread can be enjoyed by the sinner, it must be received by the sinner. You know, this is such a simple thing, but I've experienced that a lot of people stumble right here. They want to enjoy heaven's bread, but have never actually received heaven's bread they can you know there's people that can believe maybe this is you sitting here this morning i hope that this is not the case but we can believe that jesus was real we can believe that jesus died on the cross 
And we can even believe that he rose from the dead. However, to make his sacrifice and the salvation that he offers a reality in your life, you must come to him and receive him by faith and be born again. Let me, let me illustrate this for a second. Imagine that I invited you over to my house for dinner, which is never going to happen because I don't know. Okay. I'm, I'm kidding. I, imagine for a second that I invited you over to my house for dinner. My wife cooked an amazing meal because she's awesome. We're sitting at the dinner table, and I pass you a plate of hot, buttermilk biscuits. I pass them to you and I say, hey, do you want a biscuit? And you say, yes, thank you. I would love a hot buttermilk biscuit. I really want a biscuit now. (laughs) So I pass this plate to you and I say, hey, do you want a luscious hot buttermilk biscuit? We got melting butter over here you can spread on it. We got some honey if that's your liking. We got jelly. Do you want one of these buttermilk biscuits? And you say, yes, I want that biscuit. And then everybody starts chanting, give me, okay, give me the biscuit. I pass the plate to you, but instead of reaching out and taking it, you simply sit there and you go, Yeah, I want that biscuit. I want that biscuit. I'm going to look at you like you're a crazy person. And I'm going to say, well, if you want the biscuit, oh, I do. I want that biscuit. I'm going to say, then then why aren't you taking it? Well, if you want it, you're going to have to, like, reach out and grab it. And put it in your hand, bring it up close to your mouth, and take a bite. I'm not going to take this hot buttermilk biscuit, pick it up, and put it in your mouth. Unless you insulted my wife, then I will pick it up, smash it into your face. You know... Not that this is a perfect illustration, but salvation somewhat works the same way. Jesus has already done everything. Jesus has already done everything that is necessary to save a sinner like you and me. He has completed the work. He poured his blood out upon the cross. He was put into a grave, and he rose from the dead. He has done everything necessary to save sinners. But before you can be saved, you're going to have to come to him by faith. Now, in this, it's not going to cost you a dime to be saved. It won't even cost you a nickel or penny. But it will cost you your life. It requires that you receive him by faith. Look back at verse 47 with me in John 6 one more time. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. To be saved, you have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. This word, believe, simply means to rest the totality of your weight upon him. What does it mean to believe? To rest the totality of your weight upon him. It isn't Jesus plus this. It isn't Jesus plus that. It is Jesus and Jesus alone 
that can save. Bread, and I hope you eat some bread today, will satisfy you for a short period of time. Jesus, however, says, I am the bread of life. This is the first I am statement that he makes. I am the bread of life. And if you take of that bread, which is his flesh and blood, which we celebrate in communion, that in that alone is what can satisfy for all of eternity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for being the bread of life, that we can believe and receive you as our Savior, as our King, as our Lord. You will save us. You are just and merciful and gracious to save. You're not even slow to save. Father, if there are those amongst us today that are ready to take that step and and place their trust and rest the totality of their weight upon you. I pray that you convict their souls, whether they're in this room or watching online. We thank you, Father, that you and you alone are the one that can satisfy. Bread is temporary, but your bread, your flesh, is eternal. Help all of us, every single one of us, rest the totality of our weight upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to move into our time of offering. We're not going to pass a hat, a plate, a boot, anything like that. If you want to give in the offering, which is a spiritual act of worship, you can do so in the box right outside these doors, two boxes in the lobby. Or give online at cclcfamily.org backslash give. And I want to remind you of another word of the Lord where he says this. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Giving, offering, is a spiritual act of worship. And I want to challenge you to give above and beyond what you have been. We've got some incredible things coming up um, with, with, with things that are just simply going to need money. <laughs> and I want to encourage you that if you call this your church home, to give. I'm going to pray one more time and we're going to close out. I promised Matt that we would be out of here so he could watch the Super Bowl. I feel like my sermon was under seven hours today, so let's pray. Father, help us find rest. Help us find trust in you. Father, in our own sinful flesh, we want to believe that we have to figure it all out on our own. We want to believe that we can pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and and make this money thing work. We, We want to believe that that what we have is ours. But you tell us that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything under creation belongs to you. In fact, all creation longs for you and screams for the glory of the Lord. Father, help us understand what it means to give our entire lives over to you. Help those amongst us that are weak in their faith not be tempted by Satan to say that the church is just in it for the money. 
help us understand that you're not trying to pull the money out of our pockets, but you're trying to pull the idols out of our hearts. Help us trust you more today, Father, and multiply our offering for the benefit of your name and the expansion of your kingdom. In Jesus, the bread of life, I pray. Amen. Glad to have you guys here today, whoever finds Christ. God bless you.